take regular time to marvel at God's greatness. What we do in life echoes in eternity. I often think of the galaxies in outer space as being symbolic of God's eternal vastness. No doubt its hugeness behind, beyond our comprehension. Light from some of the closest stars takes 2,000 years to reach Earth. Beam me up, but that's just the physical world. Eternity is infinitely bigger than that. It's changeless, timeless, and it's the real of spiritually and God's mighty attributes. It's the realm of ultimate reality of com uh, completeness and wholeness, where things are finished and sat settled. It's also the realm of right now. When God called Moses at the burning bush, he told Moses to tell the people that I am sent him. That's terrible English grammar, but perfect theolo theological grammar, so I suppose theology wins out over English. I am in the way God wanted Moses and the people to think about him. I am his eternity past right now and always in the future at all at the same time. Yep, it's pretty baffling. That's the point. God is so infinite and vast that to describe him is an exercise in futility. Is God that infinitely large in your prayers and worship? Lord Jesus, how awesome is your eternal vastness. Praise your mighty name. Keep eternity fixed in my heart. Keep my mind sent on things above. I need to be reminded all the time of your greatness. Do whatever it takes, Holy Spirit, to keep you first in my heart as the Lord beyond merger in all ways. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Living now with the next word in mind. If I find in myself desires which nothing is the, in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Believers in Jesus live on two planes of existence simultaneously. Don't worry, I am not about to go science fiction on you. Actually, this is even crazier than science fiction. The truth is that we live in Christ and we also live in Dallas, Phoenix, London or wherever. We are in Christ spiritually and yet we are in our physical location, living our lives with work, family and other commitments. Yeah, it sounds nuts, but the New Testament is full of this dual reality. Consider Paul's salutation in Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ and Colossae. Notice the four words at the end of this verse, in Christ at Colossae. He is saying that they are in Christ, but that they are also in Col Colossae. How can someone be in both places? Think about what Paul wrote in another letter to Corinthians 4 to 18. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The words temporary and eternal are, um, are key here.
here. The world we live in can be seen. It's physical and visible, and we interact with it con uh, continuously. It's also temporary. It's here for a while, but then it will go. Then there is the visible world. world. It, uh, it is Christ and all that comes with him. He is our purpose for being the reason we go about things in the physical world. We like to comp uh, compartmentalize and sort things. That's why label makers are organizing software cell well. But we can comp uh, compartmentalize the eternal and the temporary. The two are inter interchangeable for believers. We live in both right now, and if we are paying attention to the eternal, our temporary life will show it. Jesus, thank you for putting eternity into my heart. Thank you for the timeless perspective you give me. Help me live in such a way that my temporary life points to your eternal work. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Prioritizing the eternal over the temporary. Happiness is neither without us nor within us. It is in God, both without us and within us. Kids and Christmas morning, that's the temporary world in the extreme. The holiday season now officially starts shortly after Valentine's Day, followed by months of hype that fuel the hopes and the dreams of children and retailers everywhere. When the big day arrives, it's over in approximately 47.29 seconds. It's a rush, to be sure. And who doesn't like getting nice presents, even as an adult? But don't you also notice how fast it's all over and the kids just move to the next thing? So it goes with everything in the temporary realm. It has a timeline, a beginning and end. It's a realm of activity, of processes, and of physical needs. It's the realm where we see both good and evil. There is birth, growth, and death. With all our senses, we can experience God's gift of creation in mountain ranges and valleys full of wild uh, flowers. With our hands and our minds, we can joyfully receive all the great stuff He has given us in the temporary realm. But this is actually the danger of the temporary realm. It does have a lot of great stuff and it's really easy to love stuff to love stuff more than the one who made it it's like telling god i like you but what i really love is your stuff as long as you give it to me oh what parents yearns for uh, for that reaction from their kids when we lost after the temporary pressures of this temporary realm, we trade the best for the stuff that's not even going to last a moment in eternity. Father, I want more than just your stuff. I want your hair, heart, not just your hand. Thank you for the temporary realm that you have created and the joy that it brings but I want to live for what I is above it. I want my life to be a pursuit of the eternal to uh, transform my heart and enable the eyes of my heart to see the things above that will last forever. 
give me the humble wisdom to allow you to live through me in a way that makes my temporary pursuits be a reflection of all that is eternal. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Prioritizing your relationship with Christ. Reality is the leading cause of stress amongst those in touch with it. When I was 22 years old, you could say my life was uh, characterized by ESPN and the Golden Arches. I watched sports when I got home and ate McDonald's while I did. If that would have been the rest of my life, I would probably have been pretty cool with that. Then one day, I was standing in the church lobby and I noticed this beautiful blonde named Libby. I would known her, uh, her since I was seven, but I would never notice her before. This is the text uh, by Pete Berisco. The rest is his story. After the knot was tied, we basket in a furia and bliss as newly weds. For a while, several years into our marriage, we started posturing and the kids started coming. We spent less and less time together until one day we had to sit down and say we need to change some things. We are growing apart. Do you remember those early days when you came to Christ, how it felt like you couldn't soar any higher in your spirit. Then life took over and you still loved Jesus, but the blinding excitement of it eventually faded. On earth, there is constant tension between the temporary and the eternal. It's natural and normal to feed this tension. We ought to feel the pangs of yearning, yearning uh, for the eternal. And at the same time, we need to seek joy in Christ as we go about the normalcy of today. In the same way that Libby and I sat down and made it a priority to talk about our relationship, you need to do that regarding your relationship with Christ. Overcome the tension and cut through the clutter of the temporary. Sit down, be still, and listen to the Holy Spirit as you read the word. Jesus, I feel tension. Sometimes I have great days and sometimes I have terrible ones. Teach me and groom me. Give me an awareness of your presence in me and around me right now. Quiet my soul that I can be still and know that you are my God still. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. No longer sinners, we are holy sons and daughters. God created out of nothing wonderful you say yes to be sure but he does what is still more wonderful he makes signs out of sinners you are not a sinner saved by grace let me explain at one time you were a sinner but now that you are saved your sin driven past is behind you you are not a scientist who sometimes sins. The difference is in how God looks at you. Look at how Paul describes who you are in Christ. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and the term holy is the same word used for science. If you 
continue to say that you are just a sinner saved by grace you are saying your identity is still that of a sinner not true at the very moment you trusted Christ you stopped being a sinner and started being a saint you were saved by grace from your sin but your identity as a sinner is gone you are now a child of God if we walk around constantly identifying ourselves as sinners saved by grace we are communicating to ourselves to and to others that we are defined by our previous identity it's tricky isn't it we want to fully acknowledge to the father and those around us that we continue to sin but the father doesn't want his children to identify themselves as sinners am i just playing with words here absolutely not the distinction between seeing yourselves yourself as a sinner or seeing yourself as a scient makes a huge difference in the way we live our lives because no think about that one for just a little bit in the next days we are going to explore the importance of that in more detail Lord Jesus, I am not defined as being a sinner any longer. I am a saint who sometimes sins. Give me the strength and courage to recognize this and to begin to live in the victory that it proclaims. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Managing your sin doesn't work. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to be. Let you, uh, your goodness like a fetter bind my uh, wandering heart to, to you. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here is my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Someone who believes they are a sinner saved by grace tends to focus on sin management more than pursuing intimacy with God. They are too busy trying not to sin to really embrace life as a saint. It's almost as if they are just waiting to sin again, feeling doomed by its inevitability. Managing sin keeps us looking down in the dumps. We are never quite able to see beyond the next mistake. What a tiring way to live. Now, no one is saying that the saint is in Christ is going to live a sinless life. Actually, some people do say that, but that goes contrary to scripture too. What this means is that our identity is not that of a sinner. Paul had an interesting take on the believer's relationship with sin. Here is a trustworthy saying that this deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. That might seem like a contradiction to everything we have been taking about, talking about. But if you de- dig deeper, you will see that Paul is affirming the sinfulness of his actions, never denying that it's God's grace and not his behavior that saved him. In passages like Philippians 3, Paul tells people to 
imitate him. He wouldn't tell them that if he was still the worst of sinners, he is acknowledging the reality of sin, but wants his re- readers to understand that it's rooted in their old self residue from their past life and the flesh we are indeed prone to wonder like the old hymn says we will always struggle against our flesh the world and satan instead of seeing the christian life as merely a struggle to manage sin we can embrace the thrill of being a believer in spite of our sin lord by the power of your spirit in me focus my heart and my thoughts on your perfection rather than on my perfections consume my heart with your purity and righteousness and your presence so that the reality of my sin would be drawn out by your blazing light amen hallelujah amen yes christian you can dance delighted to dance many believers fall into the habit of marching through life exhausting themselves to earn god's approval but the truth is jesus didn't come to burden you with a tireless to-do list in the galatians and speaks speaks a word of rest to the worn out christian life with jesus isn't about the glory of your accomplishments for him it's about the beauty of his work for you finished forever once and for all put it into practice scripture describes god's macro plan for the created order and it also describes God's micro uh, micro uh, micro plans for individual uh, followers of Jesus but what about you you specifically how do you take the take what God's word says and put his will into personal practice experience the joy of knowing God's will for you. God has placed a personal call on your life that no one else can fulfill. You will learn how God has a will and a plan for you and how the Holy Spirit can empower you to find and follow his call. Hoping in Christ helps free you from sin. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Joy is the serious business of heaven. In 2009, the world was interrupted and raptured with the harrowing rescue of 33 men trapped in a mine in Chile. The drama played on some of the greatest human fears, darkness, suffocation, isolation, you name it. But thanks to a small borrowed hole, the men were able to receive goods uh, from the surface. Interestingly, despite their dire predicament, the men later admitted that things were occasionally tense, although overall they were never that terrified. That seems odd, doesn't it? It turns out that a team of uh, psychological experts recommended that the rescue commanders on the scene come up with projects and activities for the men to do while the rescue tunnel was drilled 
These tasks did not technically assist them in their rescue, but it did something just as important. It kept hope alive. They overcame tremendous hardship because they had tremendous hope. Because of who we are in Christ, we can latch on to a similar tangible hope of rescue from sin. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. You can almost hear Peter shouting this encouragement. He is bursting with infection, infectious enthusiasm. He is desperate for the people to see that the Father has done something so wonderful that their entire lives need to become consumed with it. Go back to when you first came to know Christ. Why was it so exhilarating? A big part of it was probably because you felt something like Peter was describing in that verse, living hope. For perhaps, for perhaps the first time, you truly felt purpose. You had a sense of lasting joy and fulfilled life. You shed your old self for new beginnings. Knowing who we are in Christ, understanding the unconditional love of a perfect Father, it's like that mind shaft of hope that brings light into our darkness. And yes, that hope is our way of escape. There is no longer a need to feel trapped in an ins in inescapable hole of sin and darkness. Hope has come. Lord, I have no hope apart from you. Thank you for breathing life into my soul, for transferring me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>